A reading from the second book of Samuel. David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. David and all the people with him set out and went from Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark of, the Lord, of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who is enthroned on the cherubim. They carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the ark of God. And Ahio went in front of the ark. David and all the house of Israel were dancing before the Lord with all their might, with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed an ox and a fatling. David danced before the Lord with all his might. David was girded with a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with a shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. As the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. They brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and offerings of well-being before the Lord. When David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the offerings of well-being, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts and distributed food among all the people, the whole multitude of Israel, both men and women, to each a cake of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins. Then all the people went back to their homes. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading of Psalm 24. Let us read the psalm in unison. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, though all the world and all who dwell therein. For it is he who founded it among the seas and abated it from upon the rivers of the deep. Who can ascend the hill of the Lord and who can stand in his holy place? Those who have clean hearts and a pure heart, who have not pledged themselves to falsehood, nor sworn by what is a fraud, they shall receive a blessing from the Lord and a just reward from the God of their salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, of those who seek your face, O God of Jacob. He is the King of glory. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Ephesians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up things in him, all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, 
who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, according to St. Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. King Herod heard of Jesus and his disciples, for Jesus' name had been made known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work. But others said, it is Elijah, and others said, it is a prophet like the one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men to, who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother's Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter, Herodias, came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore it to her. Whatever you ask me, I will give you, even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for, she replied, the head of the John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer, please be seated. Before I begin, let me say that I'm really quite envious of Father Allen's preaching style, but it is not mine. I script my sermons for two reasons. One, to keep a very active mind focused, and second, to keep me within an appropriate time constraint. You have to realize that as a faculty member, of gra a graduate faculty member, I'm quite capable of going for three, three and a half hours. But I promise you we won't go that uh, long this morning. Today is the seventh Sunday after Pentecost. This season, as I'm sure you are all aware, is our longest liturgical season of our church year. It takes us through summer and up to Christ, the Sunday of Christ the King, which is the Sunday before Thanksgiving. We often view this season of Pentecost as a season of pilgrimage or a season of growth, especially growth in our spiritual lives. One major reminder of this is our use of green vestments, the color most suggesting growth. As our world around us grows, greens, and moves us towards harvest, so we seek to grow in our faith towards our eternal harvest, life everlasting with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
I must admit that this is a common theme that many of my sermons during this Pentecost season often follow, but one I will not be following today. I also noticed that the note on the first page of your service bulletin reflects this concept as well, especially in the sentence, during this time, we are called into deeper relationship with God, with Christ, and with one another through our shared lives of prayer, worship, and work. The bulletin also notes that the season after Pentecost does not have a single theme. Still, it is a common practice among preachers to seek to find the the connection between the three lessons appointed for a particular Sunday. This has become more difficult, but not impossible, with the revised common lectionary, now used by nearly all liturgical churches. One of the major things that I've noted in my readings this summer is that scholars are changing their minds about the Gospel of St. Mark. For many years, the leading thought about this Gospel, most certainly the first of the four Gospels written, is that it was dismissed as a rough, primitive version of the good news of Jesus. Scholars today are now seeing and interpreting Mark as a sophisticated literary presentation of the story and teachings of Jesus, and that it does reflect an in-depth theology. A primary of this new look at Mark is the concept of the Markan sandwich. This is Mark's technique of interrupting a story with another story and then coming back to the first story. In this way, we find that both stories enhance, define, and enrich each other. I must confess to you at this point that we are in danger here, that my background as a teacher and a professor uh, and my own scholarly curiosity may overwhelm us a bit, but I will try to keep my comments brief and clear, and I promise you there will not be a quiz at the end. It's only been recently that scholars have begun to pay attention to this Markin sandwich technique. The reason is probably because the study of Scripture, especially the Gospels, that form criticism approach has influenced our scholars. The chief objectives of this method are to recover as far as possible the units of oral tradition which became the building blocks of the later written Gospels. Thus, form criticism is a search for the most ancient narratives, and therefore scholars of this school believe this is the most reliable way of reporting Jesus' words and teachings. This method of study is and remains an important approach to Scripture, and to be honest, is the method in which I was schooled in seminary. However, in the past two decades or so, new methods in gospel interpretation have been introduced. They've not replaced form criticism, but they have brought alternative and important perspectives to the table, and they broaden and deepened our understanding of the Gospels. The Markin sandwich is one such concept that these new approaches have introduced, and it comes to us from the so-called structuralist approach. Structuralism claims that the authors of the canonical Gospels were not, as one scholar says, and I quote, witless water boys schlepping water from a spring, the creative oral tradition, to carry to thirsty hordes the readers. They were themselves creative theologians who molded the tradition which they received for their individual uh, purposes from the work of, of James Edwards. Edwards goes on then to say that we were missing the boat as long as scholarly interest was directed towards the sources of the Gospel of St. Mark, that is, the oral units and forms 
the historical background, and the earlier prototypes, such as the Q source, which is thought to be a lost prototype of the gospel tradition. What we should be doing is to consider the Gospel of Mark as a literary product. Edward says, Mark, and again I quote, was judged rather like one of Cinderella's ugly stepsitters. And Mark was seen as neither a historian nor an author. He assembled his manner in the simplest manner thinkable. Some scholars criticize Mark rather harshly. It was claimed that, and I quote, Mark is not sufficiently master of his material to be able to venture on a systematic construction himself. One other scholar even decried Mark's literary achievement. The point is settled. The author of Mark was a clumsy writer, unworthy of mention in any history of literature. All of this was changed, and dra dramatically so, however, with the introduction and acceptance of structuralism. For in structuralism, the literary patterns or structures which the evangelists use in writing their narratives are examined. Therefore, structuralists have had the most to say about Mark's sandwich technique. It's important to realize that St. Mark often uses this technique of breaking into a story with another story. In fact, there are nine occurrences of this technique in the Gospel of St. Mark, which consists of just 16 chapters. I think an example might be good here. Let's go back just two Sundays ago and recall the Gospel story from the St. Mark of uh, the healing of Jairus' daughter, or as it's sometimes called, Jairus, depending whether you want the Latin anglicized version or the Greek anglicized version. You take a pick. In that gospel lesson, St. Mark tells two stories. The first story is about Jairus' daughter that is then interrupted by the second story of the healing of the woman with the hemorrhage. Jairus was a leader in the synagogue, and so he was an important man in his community. It's important to note that he fell at Jesus' feet and begged him to heal his daughter. In fact, verse 22 reads, and begged him repeatedly. Jesus agrees, and so they set off for his house, and the crowd follows him. Along the way, he passes by this woman who has been hemorrhaging for 12 years. She had exhausted her money with the physicians, but it seems that she was just getting worse. Then she sees Jesus, and she thinks, if I could only touch his clothes, I will be healed. So in the press of the crowd, she does just that. But Jesus is immediately aware that the power has left him, and he turns and says, and says who touched me? His disciples respond basically with, well, duh, look around you. Everybody's crowding in on you. The woman re realizes that she's been healed, comes forward, and she too falls on her knees before Jesus. And we hear the wonderful, powerful, and comforting words. Daughter, your faith has made you whole. Then the story of Jairus' daughter continues as Jesus and his disciples continue on the way. But they are met by members of the household who says to Jairus not to bother the teacher, but that his daughter is dead. But Jesus says, do not fear, only believe. They continue on, and the mourners are already at work, and they deride Jesus when he says that she is only sleeping. He then goes in and heals the girl. Thus, the Markin sandwich. Jairus, the woman with the hemorrhage, and Jairus again. The two major reasons cited as the reason for Mark's sandwiches are one, to build suspense, and the other, to allow for the passage of time, which this is true in both cases here. 
Perhaps the most important reason for this technique, though, is to establish a relationship between the stories, even if the exact natureship of the stories cannot be readily identified, and that ultimately the purpose is not literary, but theological. Ah, now we're getting to the heart of the situation. The purpose is not literary, but theological. St. Mark is attempting to teach us some important lessons here. In this case, I think we can readily seize that it deals with having faith, deep faith. Or as Jesus says, only believe. I think that we can acknowledge that there is more than one theme at work in the murder of the Baptist. The most obvious and important, I think, is the parallel between the death of the Baptist and the death of Jesus. I think Mark clearly intends to show that as John was the forerunner of Jesus' message and ministry, so too he is the forerunner of Jesus' death. John is righteous and suffers silently, and the same will be true of Jesus. Both Herod and Pilate are Roman officials. Both are vacillating and yield to social pressure, and both condemn innocent men to death. Surely this must have been in St. Mark's mind as he shares this Herod Baptist narrative. But it does not answer the question why he brackets this narrative, using the sandwich technique, with the sending and return of the twelve. In addition, adding the return of the twelve in just one verse seems rather awkward and abrupt. I suggest that this must mean that Mark saw a relationship between missionaries and martyrdom, between discipleship and death. And this is precisely Jesus' later teaching in this gospel in chapter 8, verse 34. If someone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. The cross, of course, was an instrument of death. By sandwiching the Baptist death into the mission of the Twelve, Mark is teaching us that discipleship may lead to martyrdom. The disciples, followers of Jesus, must consider the fate of John. Thus, John's martyrdom not only prefigured Jesus' death, it also prefigures the death of anyone who would follow him. This would be a powerful lesson to the early church that found itself in persecution. But still, it is no less strong. So, what do we carry away today? Other than some academic notes of the Mark and the Sandwich. What message? What lesson? In thinking about how I would answer this question, I remembered that it was already wonderfully expressed in the June 23rd meditation from the current issue of Forward Day by Day, a publication at its use that I highly recommend, by the way. Today in our Western world, but perhaps not so much in the Near East and parts of Africa, the possibility of martyrdom for expressing and living the Christian faith and life is remote. But there are other expressions of our witness. And I quote, Sometimes I look around the world or my neighborhood and see things that I think are wrong, but I don't get involved. 
This might be because I am confused or want to give people the benefit of the doubt or I'm uncomfortable. I might be afraid of being hurt. When I don't stand up, when I don't voice my opposition to wrongdoing, the wrongdoing is more likely to continue. Guarding against evil is more than just trying not to get involved in it myself. I also become part of the crowd that resists it, calls it out, stands out for its victims. Evil is powerful. Like many of us, I often don't feel equipped to stand against it. Our best chance of resistance can be found in community, a community that commits to being present in both the neighborhood and the world. End of quote. Now, amen. And where do we start? Where do we start to stand against evil of whatever form? In community. Right here at the altar. As we celebrate and participate in the mysteries of God. May God prepare us to be brave witnesses to his love and to stand up against the evil and wrongdoing that we meet every day in our lives. Amen. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, those done and left undone. And so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life. To the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May Almighty God grant us all forgiveness of all our sins and the grace and comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you.